So the Crow City of Angels tells the story of a murdered man brought back to life to avenge his death and the murder of his son. What's going on everybody? Welcome back to the Crow Review Series. If you're just now joining me, I reviewed the original classic 1994 film, The Crow, yesterday, so please check out that review. And now we are on to the first sequel, The Crow City of Angels. Now all of The Crow sequels are all first time watches for me. I've seen the original numerous times, I love that movie. I've never had the heart to experience the sequels because I've heard nothing but bad things to terrible things about them. And so it's gonna be an interesting ride. Now The Crow City of Angels, I walked into this one thinking that this one was the sequel that people tolerated. It seemed to be the one that gets the least amount of hate. And after watching it, I started looking online and talking to people and posting some tweets about it. And it actually seems like the next one is the one that people tolerate the most. So. Um, my expectations were a little skewed walking into this one, to say the least. I wasn't expecting a good movie. I wasn't expecting anything near the original, but I figured I would at least have a decent time with it. And, uh, wow. Yowza. So a little backstory for the Crow City of Angels. After the death of Brandon Lee, they had a lot of trouble figuring out how they were going to do a sequel. Just like nowadays, they're having a lot of trouble trying to figure out how they're ever going to revisit this franchise. Uh, so they had the original director, Alex Proyas, that was kind of getting involved with this, trying to help write the movie, and uh, his friendship for Brandon Lee prevented him from really being able to dive into it because it just kept, it kept making him think of Brandon. So he kind of walked away from the project, gave him his blessing, and you had David S. Goyer come in, who has done a ton of comic book properties. He's done quite a few of the Blade movies, which is, you know, similar tone to this. And they ended up coming up with a story after visiting a lot of fan message boards and everybody saying, don't do Eric Draven, don't touch the original movie, don't touch the original story, do something different. They came up with a story of another person that has been revived by The Crow by the name of Ash Corvin. And um, after they made this movie, they were going for a different tone, different approach, a different story, and it ended up getting meddled quite a bit in the studio. Uh, Big Bad Harvey Weinstein, that fucking asshole, came in and took the movie what it was supposed to be, hacked it all to hell, ordered some reshoots, and turned what was going to be a very different take on The Crow and something that was exploring much more of a tragic love story in, in a different way than the first film and giving, giving a different tone and atmosphere and a different vibe than the original film intentionally. And he took it and tried to make it just a quick carbon copy of the original to try to capitalize on what people liked about that original film. And the biggest criticism you will hear about this movie is that it's a pointless retread of the original film. So thanks, Harvey. Nonetheless, let's talk about the positives of The Crow, City of Angels. And I'll be honest with you, I kind of struggled to talk about anything positive with this movie. It wasn't like a terrible movie. It wasn't a movie that I was pained by watching, but everything on screen was something that I didn't necessarily like. So the few things that I can appreciate is one of which I like the fact that they kind of go for a little bit of a different tone here as far as the look of the city. The first one took place in like a comic book version of Detroit. This one being the city of angels is in Los Angeles. So where you got a lot of rain and a lot of darkness and uh, that whole vibe that the first film gave just with the atmosphere and the setting alone, here they very intentionally went for something that's a little bit more of an orange, amber, tan vibe and has a lot more smoke and smog as the atmosphere versus rain and wetness and darkness. So I kind of appreciated that different look to it because I think a, a constantly raining franchise definitely could have gotten a little bit old. So I like the stylistic changes here as far as the look of the film. There's a couple of genuinely cool shots here. One that actually stood out to me quite a bit is the when he's driving around on his motorcycle, the, the crow, Ash Corvin, and he's got like this trench coat that almost has, it's split at the bottom so it almost looks like wings whenever he is driving away in the motorcycle and they show that a couple of times. I thought that that was a pretty cool look. And I also like that there was a bit of an intentional change with the fighting style of the crow in this one. You know, you had Brandon Lee's martial arts experience in the first film that certainly played a part into some of those choreo or choreographed scenes. And in this one, it's much more of kind of a brute force. He's a lot more unhinged. Uh, he's kind of coming at these people with a lot more uh, of a frantic fighting style. So while not nearly as exciting as the first film for sure, I did appreciate that they made these two different crows very different as far as their, uh, their style of executing their vengeance. As far as the mixed aspects, the first one for me is Vincent Perez, who is the crow in this movie. And I don't know what it is about it, just his performance for some reason doesn't quite land for me. Uh, I don't know if it's because he almost purposefully looks a lot like Brandon Lee, 
to the point where it almost feels like it it's the same character but not and i think that they should have just gone a very a very different look for the character instead of somebody that's the same frame the same almost hairstyle the same facial features nonetheless uh beyond that and this is probably unfair his accent is very thick and it's very distracting for me there's even some lines of dialogue that i can't even really make out what he's saying i think he's swiss and french but in the movie it's just it's very thick in some spots like there's a spot where he's talking about this poem about crows like one crow is sorrow and two crow is joy and most of that poem i didn't know what the fuck he was saying so that i think he's a bad actor i think that he does fine here with what he's given it's just he's not given very much to do and just i don't know something about the crow like I said in the first movie, it is Brandon Lee to me. So I kind of knew I was going to have this problem. It's one of the reasons I never watched these sequels. Anybody trying to do this role just feels like they're trying and not quite nailing it. I'm also mixed on the return of Sarah. Now, in the first film, the performance of the young girl was really the only thing that I feel has not aged very well. And not that I did dislike that character, because I think that she's a pretty decent little companion for Brandon Lee's character in that original movie. But bringing her back in this one, again just kind of calls attention to why is this not eric draven i understand why they didn't do that and it's all because of brandon lee and the tragedy and everything totally get it but when you have the guy look like brandon lee and you bring a character from the first movie that was the the only real human relationship that he had in the first movie it just calls more attention to really she's there again for somebody else to be revived by the crow why is she so special uh, but there is something about her being back and kind of being the guide for this new crow that kind of works well. And it's always nice to have some character that we can walk into this movie and have some form of attachment to because we recognize it from the other film. We don't have to play a lot of catch up with a whole new cast. But I don't know. Something about it is it, it, I like the intention of it. The, the version that we did not see where it was going to be this tragic love story to where she brings back Ash and she has all these visions and, and they kind of fall in love with each other and she, you know, she's his guide, she's his helper and he keeps coming back and then by the end of it he was supposed to give up the afterlife to stay on earth with her just for her to be killed by the main villain and he's plagued to walk this earth alone. That's a really dark, interesting way to end this movie and very... Uh, very big contrast from the story that they were telling in the first film, but that's not the version we got. So the version that we get is just, hey guys, it's Sarah, they love each other because, and she's dead. And there was even a version of this story that was going to have her come back by the end to be a female crow, and I even think that was pretty cool of an idea. Uh, but again, we don't see that one. And finally, I don't know how I like the different approach that they took to the story and the, the tone of the movie. I like the atmosphere change. I like the stylistic change of the visuals of the city and everything, but this is much more of a kind of dark tragedy and going for that sorrow side of the crow and taking away all of the fun that we had in the first movie. I mean, the first one's dark, the first one's doing a lot of heavy things, and it's certainly violent and has some very disgusting characters, but it has fun along the way. Brandon Lee has fun along the way. We have fun watching him. The action scenes are exciting. This one is just dark, and this one is just depressing, and this one is just down in the dirtiness of LA, and so there's never really any levity in this. There's no humor, there's no uh, having fun as far as Ash Corvin is concerned. He's a little bit more frantic and he does these magic tricks and stuff, but it's not fun and like toying with the victims. It's just like a really unhinged person. Uh, and so I, I like the fact that it's tonally different than the first movie as much as it can be, which kind of got fucked up by the theatrical cut, but I think that we are missing the fun here. And now moving on to the negatives, and yeah, thanks to the extreme meddling by Harvey Weinstein, this movie is an absolute pointless, lifeless retread of the original film, which is exactly what the fans said that they didn't want. <laughs> there's a legacy with that original film, there's a love for it, there's a tragedy involved with it. Everybody scream from the, the rooftops, don't just do the same shit again, don't just retread what we already did, it's disrespectful and leave it to that guy to be disrespectful and just give us the most lifeless movie that you can give. I mean, there is so many points in this movie, both story-wise, character-wise, even visual-wise, that is just right out of the first film. I mean, guy rises from the dead to avenge a dead family member, a dead loved one, and then just goes one by one through this really over-the-top gang to get to the guy that's the head of the snake to have this big showdown and then do some kind of a power to kill him by the end of it. I mean, it's just... Wash, rinse, and repeat. 
They even kill the crow in this one. It's a little bit more violent than the last film, but it's everything that we have already seen before. And this version really feels lifeless because it just lacks the style and, and lacks the uh, the fun and the atmosphere of the first film. Again, I appreciate the fact they tried to do something different, but it just doesn't completely add to the vibe that we now know and love as the crow. That, that is now templated. That original film is loved so much. That is what we want. That is what we expect as far as the vibe of the movie. And they, they just don't go for it. They totally miss all of the style and everything that made the first film so cool. They just kind of halfway understand that. All right, it's got to look like this. The makeup's got to look kind of like this, which even the makeup doesn't. It looks like somebody drew it on with a pen. Uh, you know, he's got to drive around the city and he's got the villains have to be really crazy and kooky. And it just feels like somebody took notes from the first movie and didn't fully understand why that worked in the first place. And speaking of those kooky villains, they're all forgettable here. I got a little bit excited when I started seeing the opening credits and saw some cast members that I actually remembered and, and saw Thomas Jane. And I was like, oh, cool. The Punisher is in this. Yeah, he's in one scene where he's jacking off in a booth and then he gets killed. So. Okay, uh, none of them really stand out as personalities, not even like the, the kill scenes stand out like they did in the first film where he kind of kills them in a way that represents their character in a certain extent. They're just random kooky characters, especially like worst of all is uh, the guy that is the head of the snake, the main villain by the end of this film to where he's just like this prophet that's walking around shirtless in a robe the entire time and you know is waxing away and he has a fucking uh, female with him that can see the future and is clairvoyant just like the original film and then he just decides by the end that i'm gonna be the crow and i'm gonna take the powers and the way that he dispatches them man like the the cgi in the first film has not aged well in some spots but the cgi that they use here and that one scene at the end was god awful like why they would take what was originally supposed to be a murder of crows picking this guy clean all the way to the bone to just a blurry effect of him having a bunch of CG crows go through him and then he's dead. That was like the most unsatisfying way to take out that character. It's a character that you're not even really standing out with that much to begin with. You could have at least made his death stand out and that was one of the worst parts of the movie. So all in all guys, what I'm left with with this film is that it's pointless. Would I be fascinated to watch like a reassembled director's cut? I actually would. It sounds like there was some interesting ideas there that got chopped away and hacked away by the producer, but I don't know if we're ever gonna see that. I don't know if this movie has any kind of a following that would merit the money it would take to reassemble that movie. So as it stands right now, the cut that we have of City of Angels is a movie that I'll probably never watch again because it's just a pointless, lifeless retread of everything in the first movie. I will always watch that one. So if you're a fan of the original Crow, just rewind it and watch it again because the second movie basically does the same thing without near the amount of style, atmosphere, or love for the original property. So go ahead and skip this one. So what do you guys think of The Crow City of Angels? Are you a fan of this movie? Are you somebody that's actually been dying to see that director's cut? Or do you just despise any other iterations of this character and you'll only watch that first film? So let me know your thoughts down below, guys. And here in a couple of days, we're gonna be talking about The Crow Salvation, which again, is another first time watch for me. So be sure to hit that subscribe button if you're just now joining me so you do not miss that. Then we're talking about Wicked Prayer, and then we're gonna be doing a Crow ranking by the end of the week. So if you're a Crow fan, stick along with me. Thank you guys for watching as always, and remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be.